program. We now have nine, as of last month, had nine business members with a commitment from Avidia Bank. <coughs> Kathy Glynn is going to help with hospitality and make reminder calls. Uh, Jeanette reminded us, and this serves as a double reminder, that there will be no meetings in December, January, or February. Um, our March meeting will be, it came from the Assabet River with Drew and Kathy Simmons. They'll speak about things they've collected out of the Assabet River. Now tonight, our program is called Veteran, uh, Bedford Veterans Hospital, Home for Many Heroes and Heroines. And this has been arranged by our second vice president, Al Temple, who is a volunteer of many years at the hospital. Uh, Laurel Holland, she is the chief of voluntary service at Bedford VA and former seaman Kevin Doherty, um, a voluntary specialist at Bedford VA. Uh, Laurel Holland holds a master's degree in social work and has more than 40 years of practice and has spent the last 11 years working directly to end veteran homelessness. Uh, Mr. Doherty has a musical talent he shares with veterans at ceremonies and special occasions. He holds a master's degree in logistics and transportation and arranges special events and trips for our veterans. Please give a warm welcome to our speakers. How many other veterans? Wherever we go, thank you all for your service. So let's go to the Army. We have how many for the Army? There we go. Oh, wow. Army, and then next would be the Marines. Double tub, yes, yes. Navy, right here, yeah. Navy CB. Uh, Air Force, Coast Guard. Hey, wow, Coasties do the mosties, we appreciate you. And uh, we have the National Guard that's out there, and we have uh, even our merchant marines back in, in the war served, and we appreciate them so very much. Um, usually what I do when I get the opportunity and the honor to, to perform for the veterans, um, I always tell the veterans there at the VA, I mean, Chief Holland, she's my boss, and she is, she's a fantastic boss, uh, but I always tell the veterans that I work for you. You are the best bosses I've ever had, the veterans. I'll tell you what, if it wasn't for our veterans, ladies and gentlemen, that beautiful flag wouldn't be there, so we thank you so very much. And I like to sing this uh, salute to our veterans. And Al, thank you again for uh, contacting us and inviting us. I know, and I you. Oh, God, thank you so much. Um, but um, I usually do this song for our veterans, and you know, we do have some of our veterans, like uh, Mr. Campbell. Uh, he's a Korean War veteran, and he was able to come to the Creative Arts Festival and get up on stage in his, you know, in his, he was a proud fellow too. He's in a wheelchair, but he got up and he walked up there and he sang, you know, All of Me and It Had to Be You, and he, he got gold medal. Unfortunately, he couldn't go with us to um, Iowa. The show was in Des Moines, Iowa. But he got his gold medal and he is one proud veteran. And he's going he's gonna to partake in the next one in February. So. But I always sing this song for our veterans, and you know, it's for you veterans as well. You know, thank you so much. Uh, are any of you veterans ones that used to jump out of planes? Yes. <laughs> we got one for you too. But <laughs> yeah, I, I, my feet were on the ground in a CB, I was a dirt sailor. So uh, here we go. If tomorrow all the things were gone, I'd work for all my life, and I had to start again with just my children and my wife. I thank my lucky stars to be living here today, because the flag still stands for freedom, and they can't take that away. And I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the men who died who gave that right to me. And I gladly stand up next. 
next to you and defend her still today? Is there ain't no doubt I love this land? God bless the USA. From the lakes of Minnesota to the hills of Tennessee, across the plains of Texas, from sea to shining sea, Detroit down to Houston, and New York to LA, would have cried in every American heart, and it's time we stand and say. Time gets away from me so quick, you know. And um, but there was this little, there was this fella that came uh, right on the stage. I remember seeing him and doing this song in his uniform, and that song stuck in my head. And and once I became, you know, I did 22 years in the Navy, and uh, once I got to work at the VA, I noticed that this song popped out and it meant so much to all the veterans and I just take great pride in singing it for them. So I always call them the double tough guys. Uh, these folks that jump out of planes. <laughs> all our veterans are tough, but you guys, you're extra special. <laughs> so if you don't mind, I'll sing this song for you because you are definitely the tough guy. Fighting soldiers from the sky Fearless men who jump and die Men who mean just what they say The brave men who come away Silver wings upon their chest These are men America's best. One hundred men will test today, but only three when the green beret. Trained to live off nature's land. Trained in combat, hand to hand. Men who fight by night and day. Yes, these are men, America's best. One hundred men will test today, but only three win the cream beret. Back at home, a young white waits. Her cream beret 
has met his fate. He has died for those oppressed, leaving her his last request. Put silver wings on my son's chest. Make him one of America's best. He'll be a man the test one day Have him win the Green Beret Thank you so very much, man. <laughs> Sergeant Barry Sadler. Uh, and, and I've seen this, the training on the Green Berets on television. They had it on 60 Minutes. You guys in the SEALs, not my cup of tea, because I'm not that tough. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, before I have Laurel Holland, my chief, come up and, and, and tell you about this wonderful woman here and the namesake of our hospital. We got, we got several of our veterans here that match this now. I know you know this, and if you want to yell it out, you are more than welcome to. So here we go. This is all for you. Over hill, over dell, we must hit the dusty trail as those caissons go rolling along. Counter march right about, hear those wagon soldiers shout as those caissons go rolling along. Boys, I, I, E, and field artillery, call out your number loud and strong. Go, you will always know that those caissons go rolling along. Anchors away, my boys, anchors away. Farewell to golly's joys, we sail at break of day. Hey, hey, hey. Through our last night on shore, drink to the foam. Until we meet once more, here's wishing you a happy voyage home. From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, we will fight our country's battles in the air on land and sea. First to fight for right and freedom and to keep our honor clean. We are proud to claim the title of United States Marine. We're always ready for the call, we place our trust in thee. Through surf and storm and howling gale, I shall our purpose be. Semper Pratis is our guide, our fame, our glory too. To fight, to save or fight, and I, I, Coast Guard, we are for you. Now, with all that said, flying in from a thousand feet in the air, they're blowing the smoke out of red, white, and blue. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the United States Air Force! Off we go in the wild blue yonder, climbing high in the sun. Here they come, zooming and need our thunder, that a boy give her the gun. Down we dive, spotting our flame from under, off with one hell of a roar. We live in fame, or go down in flame, nothing will stop the U.S. Air Force. Thank you, veterans. <laughs> now please, if you will welcome my chief, Miss Laurel Holland. If I just start talking, does it work? Okay, thanks, Kevin. So I'm not as wonderful as he says, but their annual evaluations are due this week. So <laughs> you don't have to be a history major to know what's going on there. <laughs> Thank you, Al, for having us. Thank you, Hudson Historic Society. Thank you, veterans. I saw purple heart plates out there in that parking lot. Thank you, families 
who support our veterans uh, so um, much the unsung heroes of our world, but at the hospital we see you. We see all of you and your service and your sacrifice. It's incredibly humbling. Uh, I love to, you know, know what I'm going to talk about ahead and say not look at any pieces of paper, but just as an example of uh, your public servants at work at the hospital, Kevin and I started a little before 6 this morning, and we left at 6 tonight to come here. And he's going to another job after this. So um, we're, we're dedicated, um, and I'm going to use the pieces of paper to like remember my name right now. I ran out of caffeine a couple hours ago. Um, I live in Bedford, Massachusetts, and I live in a house that was built in the 1700s. That means it's really cold in there this time of year. Um, but when I was a kid, I was one of those starry-eyed children who drive by the antique houses and go, someone should buy that place and fix it up. Little did I know, the first big improvement was asbestos abatement for $20,000 and <laughs> lead paint removal and, you know, some historic code said you had to have it done a certain way. Um, but in the third floor of the attic, still hanging there, was a Civil War uniform. And I got goosebumps from that and I learned at a very young age that you don't own an antique house, you have a turn in it. And I'm still having that turn in it, as I said to the mortgage company this week, refinancing. I've been there 30-something years, and I still have 30 years left on my mortgage. But um, So um, two miles up the street is the Bedford VA Hospital, so everyone hates me because I have no commute. I can walk to work. Um, so um, I want to tell you a little bit about the history of the Bedford VA Hospital, and I'll tell you a little bit about our namesake, Edith Norris Rogers. And since I saw that our title is heroes and heroines, not heroin. I could talk about that. We deal with that there too, but heroines. We'll talk a little bit about that. I just want to say, um, for starters, it's not Al's appraisal time. Al is an amazing volunteer, and he knows what I know, that if you work with our veterans, you just get addicted to them. There's something so you can't come over there to do something for them. You walk away with so much more than you gave. And so you just have to keep going back. And their gratitude is profound, especially, and this will make me cry, so kick me. Um, sometimes I'm at an event like this, and the veterans will be there. The World War II veterans, we're still so privileged to have some with us. And come up there. We'll, we'll introduce you. You know, you don't have to be strangers. Um, what means something to you about this event today? And Mikey, the, the veterans, will say, oh, my God, you haven't forgotten us. That just, just breaks my heart. You know, I pray every day that we are the country that you fought for. You know, may we be worthy of your service and your sacrifice. And when I was a kid and I looked at that antique house and thought, oh, my gosh, it's so old. Well, I don't know, I've got a few more rings around my trunk since then, but um, 100 years doesn't seem that long ago, you know. And as you all know, because you are great fans of history, we just celebrated the end of the, the 100th year anniversary of the end of World War I, November 11th. And I was thinking, because I'm guilty of this, I have the fancy app on the phone, you, you know. Imagine, can you imagine World War I of imagining such a thing would exist? where at the 11th hour of the 11th month, on the 11th day, the app went off and rang peace bells all around the country. And I had set that, and I was really um, tuned into imagining back what that was like for these families to finally have the end of World War I. And um, so that's been, I've been just very mindful of that in my life because of this amazing milestone and, you know, what have we learned and what are we still learning and what are we repeating because we don't know our history. Um, but during, um, during World War I, the injuries then, the signature injuries of those wars, there was a lot of head trauma and incredible mental illness, psychiatric, what we would call PTSD now. Um, and, but they didn't have the medicine and the research we have now, so they thought the cure or the best you could do with veterans returning from war was to put them someplace serene. And usually that meant they were locked up. And the, and the Bedford VA was no exception, so around um, before the war ended, they started appropriating funds 
for serene environments. And the patients who came from Bedford VA, which just celebrated its 90th anniversary this year, I brought you some buttons because they're kind of historic looking and you might have fun with them. Um, so they started looking around for a quiet place where they could put these veterans in. They didn't have things like the T or bus lines or anything, but they built a train in through the woods to get supplies to the hospital. And they had a self-sustained community, which was how VA hospitals, they weren't called VA hospitals then, but they were, um, the doctors lived there, the nurses lived there, they had entertainment, a swimming pool, uh, you know, all that stuff they built because they pretty much put you as an island, you know, to go heal. You were a little dangerous maybe to society people didn't know. In fact, the Bedford Historic Society, who's an incredible support to us, often talk, and there are still people alive in Bedford who remember this, there was, um, it's a big giant system of buildings. We have about 170 acres right now and over a million and a half square feet for the mathematicians who like to imagine cleaning those buildings. Um, they, there was a whistle. And so if any of the veterans escaped, it's kind of like a cloister. It's all you know closed in. If any of them escaped into town, the big whistle would go off. Oh no, there's a vet on the loose. Get him back there. And somebody would dutifully you know, get him back to the hospital before it caused any trouble. So you can imagine people are afraid of psychiatric illness or readjustment or the things that we treat now um, very differently. One of our, um, you know Debbie, Debbie's been in the VA for 45 years, so half the time it's been there. And she, she kind of has every piece of paper she's ever touched. And she brought in her orientation paperwork from 45 years ago. It said this, so, you work with mental patients now. They're like regular people, only they have injuries with their brain and they don't think like you and I do. But you still have to be nice to them and treat them like human beings. Can you imagine talking about a psychiatric issue like that nowadays? Because nowadays we know better and we treat these illnesses. And so, that has um, shown up in really interesting ways in the census of the hospital. It opened with about 350 beds. The end of World War II, there were 1,700 patients there. We're back to 350-ish, you know, but um, so you can sort of see the um, research and science, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, so our very first patients were really, you know, they were starting to open up hospitals at the end of World War I. Our very first patients were veterans of the Spanish-American War, the Civil War, World War I. So when you're walking through those halls, if you have a love or a sense or a, a reverence for history, you get goosebumps. You just know um, these are our heroes and whether you ever knew them or not, they walked through the halls. The other thing that happens when you walk through our halls, because it's 90 years old, is you have to watch out for puddles. The tunnels leak really bad and the plumbing gets screwed up. And sometimes there's a sign that says, all the bathrooms in building 62 don't work, go to 61. You know, um, you, see, you feel with all the good things of history, the bad things, you know, we have, um, we have our issues. So this hospital opened up for the head injury, head, head injury and psych. And we still to this day specialize in that. And we have um, the Bedford VA is the largest veterans nursing home. We don't use that word, but you know it that way, uh, in the whole country. There's no other VA in the whole country that has as many patients who live as residents in nursing care. So for Kevin and I and those and Al, those of us who volunteer and work in that area, we're looking deeply at the quality of life for heroes. And I often think on my very tiny commute to work, if people ever knew the heroes, who are your neighbors, you would knock down the doors to get their autograph to be with them. And I think one of our favorite things to do in voluntary service is to find any way we can to honor our veterans. I live for that, and I'll tell you some of the fun things we do in that regard, and certainly Kevin's talent is a big part of that. So when um, the hospital opened up, patients came from Brockton and Jamaica Plain to go up there on the, on the farm, and some of the, you know, understanding of psychiatry translated into the physical plant. So um, one president thought, you know, you should have a farm and you should, you know, make your vegetables and be self-sustaining and that's going to be good for you. And so we had a farm. In fact, the original um, footprint of the hospital, there was a poor farm there. And when they bought all the farms and turned it into the VA, that 
exact spot where the poor farm was. Turned out 2016, we opened up the country's first permanent housing for formerly homeless veterans who are 55 and older. So something about that land, it says we want to help people get back on their feet, like literally right on this spot. Uh, and it's beautiful. If you come up there, we'll give you a, the Cook's tour and show you all around. Uh, Kevin can drive the giant bus. He drives it over the grass so you get a better view. He's, oh, they, they go, oh it's just Kevin, you know. Who is, he was driving the bus over the lawn. That's just Kevin. Uh, so we're going to add to that um, program right now 69 homeless, formerly homeless veterans. One of the veterans who lived there when it first opened was a World War II vet who was a combat vet at the Battle of the Bulge. And it makes me sick to my stomach that the word homeless was ever used next to his name. Um, we do a lot of work with um, helping homeless veterans because it's government. So there's a lot of rules and regulations about everything. And uh, so tonight, um, I thank you for the generous donation that you're sending up to the Veterans Hospital. It's going to go right into the Homeless Veterans Fund. and. Bedford VA has, is a teaching hospital, and we have um, many centers of excellence where we do research. Those of you who are football fans, um, all that work on concussion trauma started at the Bedford VA. Dr. Ann McKee um, did her research there. We had a brain bank. It's been relocated now to Boston, but that's an example of not only serving veterans, and obviously head trauma is a key thing we worry about with signature injuries of this current war with trauma blasts. But it's also something we do for the public, that our work is funded by you, the taxpayers, me, the taxpayers, and it benefits all of us, even our little kids on the football field, to learn about what you know concussion work is about and healing and get the Gronk back on the field for me as soon as possible. I love the Gronk, and my staff remind me I could be his grandmother. I say, you shouldn't remind me of that during appraisal time. <laughs> Uh, so um, other research that we do at the Bedford VA Hospital includes homelessness. We study it on a very deep level, what works to get, we get, it's easy enough to give people an apartment, here's some new dishes, here's a bed, but getting them to keep it and getting them to stay alive in it are really hard things to do. I got a tweet on the phone the night before Thanksgiving, um, do you know anyone who can help us? We had a 31-year-old veteran die of a heroin overdose. It was his first week in his new apartment. He relapsed. And all the family wants is his uniform. And we don't have the parts. So in short order, we call everybody. We knew the Air Force Base, everyone. And we at least buried him with his honors and his ribbons and you know the dignity of a guy who came back from Afghanistan to a different battle that he didn't win. And every day we work on um, addictions, addiction treatment research, what works. So the hospital has 350 inpatient beds. Many of those are research for Alzheimer's. Um, we have an evaluation unit that just says, my loved one, we don't know what's wrong. He comes in for 60 days. We do all the fancy tests and send them back out to their world with a treatment plan. We have a beautiful hospice where the veterans go to die with dignity. And we have a special program called No Veteran Dies Alone. That means like if your loved one is in the end phase of his life or her life, a volunteer will sit there, even if you're just reading a book, so that if it's 3 in the morning and you're home getting a nap, there's somebody there when that veteran leaves this earth as just a sign of great respect and dignity. We have inpatient psych and detox units. We have. Um, care homes in the community for veterans who can't be on their own. And we have um, the domiciliary, that's a 100-day program for homeless vets to come in and get an apartment and get all the things, that, sometimes financial counseling. One of our, one of our volunteers, um, Bob, comes in, he's an accountant, he's retired, he helps you get your finances back, but his wife sends in brownies. So that gets them to go to the group because otherwise it'd be boring without the brownies. And they call it budgets and brownies. And these are highly impactful things. Sometimes when I speak, I bring some of the formerly homeless veterans with me, but I don't tell you that's who they were. And they're my colleagues now helping the other veterans. So we have huge outpatient services in mental health, primary care, um, homelessness, research for the elderly. So I want to go back, running through history again, I want to go back a little bit. And talk about um, 
Edith Norse Rogers, who was, somebody mentioned Mills. She grew up in Maine, a very privileged life. Her dad owned a cotton mill. She studied in Paris in finishing school. Um, she got out and married um, John Jacob Rogers, who had Nikki Songus' seat in Congress in Lowell, for those of you who like to follow politics. And as was the case in those days, and John was a Harvard Law graduate, and they were very active during World War I, going to all the um, theater, the battles to you know, see the vets. And she would literally see the condition they were in and the services they didn't have when they got back. Spent a lot of time at Walter Reed. John died. And in those days, the wife could take over their term in Congress, which she did. And she just didn't want people to look at her as a woman. They wanted her, she wanted them to see him as just another effective Congresswoman. So I implore you by today's standards to imagine this. In her lifetime, she was, ve until very recently, the longest serving woman, Congresswoman um, in the Lowell District. She co-authored and passed 1,200 bills. 600 of them were for veterans and their families. And they can't get anything done now. So that's just an amazing feat. And she um, is, of course, the most famously known as the co-author of the um, GI Bill in 1944. So that changed all our lives in this room, whether we understand it or not. It depends on how much you like to know all that. But that's fierce. She also, um, just jumping around history, because it's fun to do that, um, she also noticed when she's in Italy that the women were really a big part of the military there. And here they were kind of dingbats writing love letters. And uh, she really fought to have them a part of, of the service. And we needed them. So that wasn't a lot of resistance. And so she um, started the WAX, the Women's Army Corps. So if you come over to Bedford and I give you the Cook's tour and Kevin drives you around on the lawn of the big bus, you might meet Miss Lillian. And Miss Lillian is, you can't miss her. She's this tiny little peanut, and she's got a giant button on that says, I'm 101 years old. And the button is so heavy, you kind of have to pull it up so it doesn't get immodest, you know? And uh, she, she doesn't go a day without wearing that button. We had to have it made when she passed her, I'm a 100-year-old button. We have a few veterans, women over 100 years old, so a World War II veteran who's a woman um, at that age, just like, oh my gosh, this is, it, Miss Lillian puts everyone to shame. She can get out of a chair faster than Kevin, and he's in good shape. I asked her, I said, Miss Lillian, what's your secret? She probably gets asked that a lot. She said, never say no to a fun thing to do. So voluntary service, we're trying to get all the veterans to have quality of life. Get out of the hospital. Get out and live a little. Kevin will drive them to Hawaii if they want. And. Uh, so he had a trip, and this was the wounded warriors, all the big bikers, rawr, the hogs, the Harleys, the leather jackets, the tattoos, and the only one who went was Miss Lillian. So we have a picture of her with all the bikers, and you know, this is like, this is outstanding. Um, but she never says no, she goes to everything. So I'll just give you that free advice, pass that on from her, but come and meet her yourself. Um, so Edith Norse Rogers was. Um, she was famous for, they called her the flying congresswoman, because she'd take the biplanes down to Washington, back and forth. She got the airport in Lowell. Um, she would take a salary for $1 a year just to inspect all the VA hospitals and make sure a system of care existed, because there wasn't one. And veterans died very poor and uncared for during our history of this time, including there was even legislation that if you were disfigured from the war, you couldn't go out in public. So they had to make prosthetics like masks to cover us, you know, a, a scarred up face or, you know, my, um, my childhood hero had a wooden leg from Sears and Roebuck. And uh, the idea that they weren't getting any care was so obnoxious. She said, if you saw what I saw on the battlefield, you would never stop doing every single thing you could for these men and women. And I think she was really true to her word on that. And in 1978, Jimmy Carter named our hospital the Edith Norse Rogers Memorial Veterans Hospital for our 50th anniversary. And I say this all the time to our volunteers. If I had $50 and said, if you get the name of our hospital right, I'll give you this $50, I'd still have it at the end of the day. They call us everything, Bedford VA, Edith Norse, blah, blah, blah. 
another fun thing if, for the history bus, which is, I assume is everybody, um, Edith Norse Rogers was a direct descendant of Nurse, the, one of the last women who was hanged in the Salem witch trials. Um, Miss Lillian is from Salem. And she says, but I am not a witch. You know what I'm <laughs> um, so um, Edith died in, on September 10th, 1960. And there were eight horrible days until we got another hero for the, vet, the Bedford VA. And that was Kevin Doherty, who was born eight days after Edith died. So we have Kevin now as one of my heroes, I think. And he says he works for the veterans. He's my boss, too. Um, Kevin was fortunate enough to serve in peacetime. And he gets it. He will do anything for the veterans. One, two years, last year was the 75th anniversary of the Navy CBs. Your husband, CB, any other CBs here? Um, so they had a really cool event down in the Constitution, and so we brought a bunch of World War II vets and a bunch of CBs. Um, and the Constitution's not handicap accessible. So but CBs, they don't care what the rules are. They don't care if it can be done. Next thing you know, the wheelchairs are all ditched, and all the patients are up there on that boat acting like the Pope and uh, getting their pictures taken and, and you know, kisses and, and being treated like the celebrities they are. But we forget that because it, you know, they are tucked away. And so part of what we care about in voluntary service is that we get them untucked and out there and that you feel welcome to come in and see the care they get and the love, and they truly love to be remembered. Um, so just jumping around a little bit, another example of what we do for our veterans and some of our heroes is this. You may have seen this on the news. The USS Heidner is at the um, port right now in Boston. So Saturday, that ship will be christened, and Thomas Heidner was a, he would let me tell you this, it's not a privacy violation. He died a year ago, this week, I think. Um, the ship is being um, named after him. He's a Medal of Honor. Well, he served in World War II, Korean War, and the Vietnam War, and he lived in Concord, Mass., so some of you may have known him. Just an extraordinary human being. And we're going to bring um, some of the patients to see the ship christened in his honor this Saturday. So that will be part of Kevin's magic. And, you know, volunteers help us make that happen because we have wheelchairs and, you know, potty issues and all kinds of things that help us to make sure they get out of the hospital and receive the honors that they clearly deserve. Um, do you know um, Hudner was um, the first Medal of Honor recipient in the Korean War, which is often not that talked about, but we have several Korean War vets. We hope Saturday will be a merciful temperature day. We can bring them. And um, he... Uh, saw a plane shot down with Jesse Brown, and the orders were there not to make yourself a hero, and he just never heard them. And I truly believe that, because he probably wouldn't have broken the rules, but he flew in and rescued Jesse, um, and then found out he could have been court-martialed for that. It was a kind of an oops, but he's one of our area's greatest heroes. So just to you know, kind of touch on that a little bit, I don't think there's a person there who's not a hero or a heroine uh, in their own right, but what does it mean if we just tuck them back there and say, oh, well, there's the Veterans Hospital. We hope the food's good. I hope that survey that the Joint Commission did comes out good. What they care about is that you remember them. And so um, I promise you, you can ask Al. It's addictive. Just come. You know, I didn't know when I went to voluntary service, because as you said, I work with the homeless veterans. Um, Bingo is a holy sacrament, and I didn't know anything about it. Whoa, it's serious. But you don't even know how to, need to know how to play it to help. They just you know, come by and help the guys put their things on their card and get their prizes, and they will love you instantly, and they remember you. Uh, every week, um, every month, Kevin and his wife put on beautiful dances at night for the vets. They have themes, and 
they were football stars last month and we, they were flappers for the 20th and we take the wheelchairs and it's kind of like the nurses would die if they saw what we do. We spin them around and we dance. There's a 39 piece band that has been volunteering for 40 years. It's like this sort of secret party after the medical people aren't looking. They have a blast and they all look very serious. You also have to go to the dance tonight and they all get lined up and the volunteers help bring them down there into the gym and then party time. And then they fill them up with sugar that they're not allowed to have and send them back up to the nurses. <laughs> and they're like, oh, what is the uh, participation for this activity seems rather high. Yes, we don't know. <laughs> so, um, so those are all ways that I think we honor our veterans is to honor their service and sacrifice, but give them a wonderful life now. The heroes that they are, that they're not forgotten. So um, let's see. I'll just mention one more thing um, from talking about homeless veterans. That is a national tragedy. We've come really, really far, you know, changing it. It's a partnership with the patients have to be ready to be well and be housed, and we have to be there for them. Um, I remember saying in one of the researches many years ago that I found homeless veterans every day on Craigslist. And the researcher said, homeless veterans don't have cell phones. I said, oh yes they do. And they're not necessarily who you expect and they can be homeless for all kinds of reasons. One guy I, I worked with once, um, there's the ad on Craigslist, it said, it was Valentine's Day, it was snowing, and it said, I'm selling my um, cordon bleu knife that I got from graduation for five dollars and my cat free and this and this and this and um, I wrote to him and I said, do you want to get rid of your cat? No. Why are you homeless? He said, well, while I was in the service, my wife didn't pay the mortgage that I was sending the money home. She had two kids. They're not mine. I wasn't even there. And I got in trouble for lack of child support, so they took my driver's license away, so I couldn't get to work. So I said to him, okay. Where are you? He was in Haverhill, Massachusetts. I said, okay, there's going to be a white van that pulls up to the corner. Get in it. It's going to take you down to Bedford, where you're going to see a fat old lady with a yellow Jeep. Put the cat in the Jeep. I'll meet you at the front gate. So off they came, and he said to me, I hurt myself selling all my furniture but it's not a war injury. Do you think the doctor would look at it? I said, of course the doctor would look at it. It doesn't have to be a war injury. So we brought him in. We, I, I could have got fired. I could have got court-martialed for taking the cat, but we did that, you know. I mean, it's the right thing to do, right? So um, cleared up his legal issues, established he wasn't the dad for these children, got him a job. Now he owns his own home, and he has a great job, and he has Thank you, God, the cat's back, you know? So there are, there are little miracles every day like that that are kind of, you know, um, the right thing to do. And, you know, but there's the researcher going, there are no homeless vets on Craigslist. Oh, yes, there are. I could find some right now for you. And uh, so we have teams of experts who know how to reach out and make a difference. And nobody ever thinks they're going to be homeless, but it happens. And so um, some of the, your donation tonight goes to a special fund that, uh, we really are restricted on what we can use for, unless you tell us we can use it this way. So this one will be used for people who sometimes in the middle of the night could get a ride to the hospital to get care or have an emergency need. And, and it will make a difference. And uh, you can be really, really proud of that because I was saying to um, the folks this, this afternoon, they have $43 left in their fund, so you have tripled their you have tripled their ability to help out with things like that. And it really, I promise you, um, we're fierce about donations. It will go to honor our veterans and change their lives. And we get more success stories than than you know try again stories. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I brought up some pictures of Edith Norris Rogers, if you like history, with some of the presidents and things like that. And um, stay around for a few minutes if I can help. Yes, Al? No, go ahead, finish up. So, so um, I thank you again. And uh, you have my personal invitation. Anytime you want to come up, we'll give you the Cook's tour. So.
All right, if you put your hands together a little bit better than that. <clears throat> there is a, um, there's a wonderful woman that lives in my, uh, my mobile home park. Her name is Eileen Dempsey. And uh, she makes uh, blankets. And normally, uh, there's a gentleman, uh, she hasn't been able to get in touch with him, that brings the blankets to the vet Bedford VA, and they're given out for uh, Christmas. And I, Eileen asked me to bring it here under the uh, condition that they only be given out at Christmas. So I spoke to Laurel, and Kevin was uh, listening while I, I was speaking, and I said, take these blankets with you, but make sure they're given at Christmas. I solemnly swear. <laughs> uh, she didn't touch on it, but yes, uh, they are always looking for volunteers at the hospital. You don't have to belong to a veterans organization, nothing. You can go in there as an individual person, but they, uh, they do look for people to help, to volunteer. So if you, any of you are interested, uh, just contact me and I'll let you know how to do it. But it's, uh, it, it's rewarding, I'll tell you. If I may, on behalf of Eileen Denton, these, uh, there's five blankets here, they're bedside, Beautiful. they're not lap robes, they're Beautiful. bed blankets. Beautiful. And I'm sure that they will enjoy it. Beautiful, thank, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. I know. I'll Help us hand out some buttons to people if they like to have the buttons. Oh, if she said, come up here and take a look. Yeah, at have, have, has take and, a buttons. We've got and, lots of them. And they're wonderful in, people. In addition to that, uh, uh, she was kind enough to mention the check, uh, which reminded me that I had the check. So on behalf of a grateful Hudson Historical Society, here's a check for the Bedford VA Fund. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so. Thank you, Kevin. I don't know if I did it right. I hope you hear me. <laughs>